go and we'll get started. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you joining us here live in our poetry studio for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry uh, here uh, in Washington State, where I'm joining you from. It is Sunday afternoon. And uh, before I get started, I just want to uh, acknowledge the uh, that today, tonight is first night of Hanukkah, and I want to wish those of you who may be um, uh, celebrating, participating, uh, I want to just send you uh, the peace of light of the season uh, for as we enter the holiday season. Well, you are joining us today for our Cultivating Voices Live Poetry New Books Showcase. And today we have four of our members who are featuring four of their collections. Um, they've all read with us uh, before at various times. So it is an incredible pleasure to welcome Carrie Magnus Rodna, Morag Anderson, Lillian Nekoff, and Barbara Quick back to the program so that we can celebrate and feature the poetry from their latest collections. Well, I'm your host, as I always am on Sundays, Sandy you know, and I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. As I said, we are in for quite a feast of poetry. Um, as I posted earlier this week. Welcome to those of you in the Zoom studio with us and to those of you watching us live on Facebook. And of course, I always send out a little heartfelt love to those of you who also will be watching the recording of this. We don't wanna forget you. We know many of you watch um, after the recording, after we posted the recording and we're really grateful I'm also tremendously grateful to Don Krieger, Kim Ports Parsons, and Kim will be posting links for the purchase of the books that we'll be featuring today. I wanna to remind all of you that since March of 2020, we've brought you poetry every, mostly every Sunday from around the world as part of our international intersectional intergenerational Facebook poetry group, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. You can always post about readings, um, events that you're hosting, uh, publications that you're putting out, uh, letting us just know uh, about your poetry comings and goings as a member of our Facebook group. And we now have over 3000 members worldwide. Well, four of those members are joining us today. As I mentioned, um, we have uh, Carrie Magnus Radna, Morag Anderson, Lillian Netkoff, and Barbara Quick. Each will be reading from their latest collections, 15 minutes a piece. And uh, let's get right to our first reader for today. With a trim, I'm just so excited to welcome back Carrie Magnus Radna, who is originally from Norman, Oklahoma. A very famous diner is in used to be in Norman, Oklahoma, that I know because one of my students' fathers owned the diner, and um, and I have memories of going to Norman and sitting in that diner. Well, now Carrie has uh, moved from the Southwest where to the Big Apple, New York City, where she is an archival audiovisual cataloger at the New York Public Library, an institution all unto its own. Carrie's also, in addition to the poetry that we're gonna hear today, a tremendous singer and lyricist songwriter who has performed at Carnegie Hall, among other iconic venues. 
her poetry uh, has appeared vastly in places like the Oracle or Oracle or Tree, Tuck Magazine, Muddy River Poetry Review, the first literary review East of Mediterranean Poetry, Shot Glass Journal, and many, many more. And today we'll be hearing from her first full length collection in the blue hour. There it is. Put it up. Beautiful. I love it. <laughs> I love the cover so much. From Nerala Publications, uh, editor Yu Sharma. And uh, so, with that first book, also be looking for her previous three chap books. And maybe she'll post about that in the chat. Carrie, it's so great to have you today. Welcome. Can't wait to hear the poems. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, this is actually my second um, uh, oh. collection. My first collection is called uh, Hurricanes Never Apologize. And uh, yeah. And, and that that's by um, uh, Luchador Press. But, but I'm talking about this book today because it's it's a real labor of love. And um, thanks to you, you and uh, a, a lot of poets that just like um, encouraged me over the years and stuff, this, this came to be. Um, I was actually at um, a, a Philadelphia um, Writers' Conference and this book kind of first sparked to life because I, I was at a, um, like a poetry seminar call, calling um, uh, Moods of Indigo and we wrote all these um, poems about blue. And I thought, hey, I wanna keep doing this. So three years later, I was done. And, and, and I sent to my friend, um, Yu Sharma, I was like, well, what, what do you think of these poems? I didn't hear from him for about a year and a half. And then one day he just sent me a, an email saying we should publish these. Like, so that's how this came to be. So I am going to be reading some of my favorite, favorite poems. Okay, this is the first one. In the sky. If all the lights blew out, can we repair the sky? Fastening the odd velvet to the outer atmosphere with tax shapes like stars. It was all ours, like a hairbreadth, like a lone church bell chime. But all alone, I did sew up the bits of invisible clouds with silver thread. And as I rested my head upon your chest for short rest, while the horizon began to bleed orange and red, I woke up in the morning fog, sweet and fragrant berry green. The sheen of the twisted black bark tree blocked the perfect view of me and you, kissed by the sun. Loose, invisible silver threads were hidden in the queue. In the sky, fast and unending, like love should be. Trees growing strong in the green, above the blue seas, below the sky, we could fly in our minds and repair the cracks no one else could see. Thank you. Uh, this next poem, which is the second poem of In the Blue Hour, I actually wrote this in five, less than five minutes because it, well, well, when I was at the Philadelphia conference, they had like this, um, uh, this uh, little, um, competition say, saying uh, poetry on the wall and, and, and the theme of it was uh, tunnels so I'm like okay I'll just write a, 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 a tunnel poem and forget about it and just tack on the wall I won third place oh my god so here here's a here's a poem the tunnel Everyone else follows the light, but I'm more interested in how sound travels within. 
Will my song vibrate the walls with a great intensity? Or will my dulce tones and notes of a nonsensical scat? Da 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 dee dee da. Be buried within the walls as the traffic racing in the Lincoln Tunnel towards New York fly past? Will my voice ride at the end of the tunnel, joining the light? Will anyone hear me eventually? Thank you. I will be his muse. I will be his muse. He's already mine. But unlike all the rest, I will not hold my sweet tongue and won't go with the status quo. And as the birds continuously sing, the water grows deeper at the lake we one day will reside and make. And the traces of the banks are sometimes washed away without regret or remorse. And so my love one day will be ours as the young people disappear from the crowd. We will return to the water where we will wash up our bones and our children, our stories and music only the birds could ever sing. Thank you. I wrote this one after I had a panic attack one day. So just reminding myself to keep breathing. So that's what it's called. Keep breathing. I will keep breathing even when caught in the dregs near the old things gathering dust that are safe in the rain and the remaining rudiments who chew their cud silently. They all commute on the morning rush train for many miles. The smiles of the haggard causes me alarm when he instructs when and where to step down and take out my umbrella. The ginger haired girls dyed their hair green, remembering spring. Rain falls down like spring, but now it's fall. And the cold, cold colds begin to blow forth, unrelenting. Notes not made for most humans now hum in my brain. I know what I'm doing and who I am. But for a while, I swim in or I am an imaginary sea crashing against the rocky street. mentioned that um, I, I do go to um, Carnegie Hall quite a little bit because I am such, you know, the music enthusiast. Uh, I mean, I wrote this whole uh, other book about it. It was my first uh, chat book. It's called um, Dead Composers at Carnegie Hall. So, so this is from uh, that book, Piano Trio, which is in here. It'll probably be the last time we get to sit on these red velvet seats. So enjoy the spell as we sit a spell. When the spirits of the old music hall and in fact our heads, staring out at us with marbled eyeballs rolled back, cockeyed, when the head wounds oozing, gazing, waiting, nodding to the beat of the music. We sat up in rapt attention watching the cellist dance with his bow and strumming fingers. His best friend, the pianist, made colors with his fat and fast digits, digitizing an emotion. The violinist, young and sharp as a lance, followed both master's temper and time carefully, though we could hear the hidden genius, genius budding. He will be a legend in 10 years time. The piano trio was written when its composer was still young, one can see the bones, the steps toward genius status, circling as the ghosts come to rest, hovering over the red velvet chairs, smiling at the sound of it. All right. This was actually a song that uh, me and my best friend, Mark Fiedler, worked out. Um, so I'm going to read the, um, the lyrics right now. It's called Sarabond 
autumn sweater. This city always keeps me awake, alone in this hotel bed, taking long deep breaths. I try to memorize the exact color of your eyes. The sweater you packed for me is for autumn, not for winter. With a slight shiver, I recall the radiant time you wore it, how warm your arms and mine, how the bare skin of your neck, as I tried to kiss it, smelled like mead. That was years ago, and you've grown cold. Too cold the air, and dark now to go wandering. How many more mites to miss your enfolding arms? I could tell where the stars are, even this faraway city. I pray to keep warm enough to get by. Blue Chevrolet. Rhinestone cowboy blared loudly on the dashboard eight track as we kids were dropped off at school. Daddy didn't care for disco much. Long lines for gasoline grew long for every day for many months. American made cars would hit the hardest, especially Fords and Chevrolets. Daddy drove an Impala in the 70s. He favored those painted in both red and maroon shades. I rode in the back seat, dreaming of fantastic blue cars, big and fast as spaceships. I wish that someday I would hold my special someone close in one of them, on the blue vinyl seat, like lovers do in the movies. So that's a little taste of childhood. This is one of my poems from my, uh, my first book. This also came to my second book. So this is called Pathos. At the end of each light, each ancient Greek, they only asked one question, did he have passion? Pathos, the word for passion, is now roughly translated as sorrow. Many wars and shifts and reasoning may have dulled or shifted the seasoning of the first original arrows, separated from erotica, enthusiasm, even simmering the odd ducks who craved to sit upon the great thinker's laps, reading the words loud to a captive audience. But accents are often changed to get ahead, books hidden, family names anglicized, works authored by those only known by their initials, holy writings favored over romances, family duties while we're waiting. People love the wrong ones. Passion becomes sorrow. My love is covered in a gaffer tape of pathos, shifting between one extreme to the other, caught in mid suspension, barely breathing. My passion, I keep it hidden when the sorrows come creeping, finally letting out of its cage in the tender moments before sleeping. How many, how much time do I have? Oh, a couple minutes. Oh, great, great, great. I'm gonna do some uh, updated ones. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gazelle called Orange. You never like the color orange, even those mod hooded sweatshirts that cool kids converge upon. The sky is now colored orange. Long days without regrets is what we could ever strive to. The beer, beer could be called orange by most people. You hated to show any fear. Your closed car heart could have been colored orange. <laughs> Once I thought you could cure my loneliness like vitamin C. See, I can't run with orange. What a cruel joke for all poets, seeing sunshine but all with only one eye open while cutting wedges of oranges, lemons, and limes, trying to dress up another drink for happy hour.
Two more. Steady. Steady as it comes, this big love is becoming too much. Like a bull, it rushes in, fast as lightning, slamming me against the wall. I have nothing against you. I hope that you're also in this, in the thick too. It's been so long, but does it sound like me being the steady one? Why should I always be the steady, the straight man when I'm with you? Do you know the things I could possibly do? Please don't twist my words around. Just because sometimes I need to be alone doesn't mean I don't love you anymore. If you're continually currently following the score, the bull doesn't always win, but then I'm not always the matador. I'll play along with this familiar song both of us can do. Why should I always be the steady, the straight man when I'm with you? Do you know the things I could possibly do? And one more, one more to top it off. Personal favor of mine, it's all trains are haunted. I think I read this here once. Good nature, buttered angels, tripped out of heaven's bar, caught their glittery shoes and minds between whirlwinds and dead turnstiles. They ride the empty trains constantly getting out of the cold rain night's gig at Washington Heights. Perhaps the shade of its grandfather took Sir Duke and Billy Strayhorn aboard towards Harlem in 1940. It's still midnight, almost the end of the line for Randy trains. It's now time to cruise over the Queen Plaza yards, to sleep with warmed up cars, to romance a special one and met on the tracks with Hort Schirmerhorn when they were hitched up for only a week. It never forgets how it shined and smelled. No hobo slept in it. Its chrome face made the other trains shiver on the tracks as they race upon the third rail. Sparks flew. We rode the 1930s vintage special train to West 4th Street. It was haunted. Spunning diesel as it rolled on slowly from Herald Square. The lights ran, went out three times a man stood in the center aisle, wearing a fedora and a caramel-colored long coat as the passengers held carved, cream-colored handles and a mint-colored interior. All subway riders are haunted by events. Broken hearts, tough working days, able drunkenness, despair, boredom, longing for home or excitement, and every time or age. Thank you so much for having me all around the world. I appreciate all of you and happy Hanukkah. Thank you, Carrie. Folks, you've been hearing our first reader today in our new book showcase, Carrie Magnus Radna from, <laughs> I love, I love that book. I love that book. Thank you. Thank you. On blue. In yes, the blue hour. There it is, yes. and the I, the cover spectacular, and all those. I took this. I took this photo. Yeah, I did. What, what, I did. what don't What don't you do? I know. I know. I... Right. <laughs> Joining us from Carnegie Hall, from Herald Square. From... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. Again, Thank you, Sammy. That fabulous it's, it's meditation on blue. Meditation on blue. And we still keep looking for those rhymes for orange. The only mm -hmm. thing we, the only thing, the best we can do is our slant rhymes for right now. That's right. That's right. All right, my friends. We move now, as I always like to say, over across the pond. Uh, we hop on over across the pond. I, uh, a person that I met in Galway on what a, a, a glorious evening a few summers ago. And 
Morag was there to showcase a poem that had won a competition that had been chosen by Rachel Coventry, one of my salmon poetry sisters. And uh, the, the second I heard your poetry, I was like, where is this person's book? And of course you were working on it. And I'm so glad now that we, that we all have the opportunity to not just continue to hear the poems, which we've been fortunate enough to hear on Cultivating Voices um, a few times um, when you join us on the open mic, um, but also now to uh, celebrate your debut chapbook uh, from one of my favorite, favorite presses, Fly on the Wall Press. Those of you familiar also know um, that that is the press uh, with that's also published Ann Walsh Donnelly, whom I also met that one glorious night in Galway. So let me tell you a little bit more about what Morag has been up to these days. Not just me waxing on my wonderful uh, opportunity to, to, to meet you in person, which was quite an extraordinary event for me in my life. Well, Morag Anderson is a Scottish poet based in Highland, Perthshire. And as I mentioned, her debut chapbook, Sin is Due to Open in a Room Above Kitties, was Fly on the Wall Press's best-selling poetry book of 2021. This year, this has been a banner year for you. I'm so, I'm so, so glad that you are getting the, um, the recognition that you and your work deserve. Um, here are some of the highlights from 2021. Uh, Morag this year was shortlisted for the prestigious Bridport Poetry Prize and placed in the Edwin Morgan Trust competition, a collaboration uh, that uh, she did with the poets Barbara de Courcy Roy, Maeve O'Reilly McKenna, and Audrey Malloy won the Dreisch Alliance Chapbook competition. And you've seen um, some posts about that on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Uh, I hope you will check out uh, as well the 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 collaborate the collaborative effort. I was so sad not to be able to go to the launch of that. Also, Morag's just been um, commissioned by the Scottish Poetry Library to do some writing about the poet Robert Burns. It is always a uh, it is just always a gift to have your voice join us. And thank you for being here tonight. And I'm, I'm just so I'm just so looking forward to the poetry. Sandy, thank you so much for such a warm welcome. And it is amazing to be here with my global poetry family. I didn't think I was going to make it because we only regained power two to three hours ago. So no heating, no lighting, definitely no Wi-Fi or mobile signal. So it's, it's even more exciting to be here. As Sandy said, I had a, a debut chat book um, published this year with a phenomenal Bell Kenyon at Fly in the Wall Press. A wonderful little cover, love this little beauty. So when Sandy asked me to participate tonight, that was the sort of latest thing that I'd, that I'd been involved in. And then along came this amazing opportunity to collaborate with three gorgeous poets, one of whom is here tonight, Maeve McKenna is in the Zoom room. Hi Maeve. Um, to collaborate on this project, How Bright the Wings Drive Us, which is equally something of um, sheer beauty that I'm really, I'm really proud to be a part of. Um, my chat book is quite a dark arc of themes, um, which maybe is fine at half past eight, nine o'clock in Highland Perthshire where it's pitch black outside, but maybe not for a Sunday afternoon on the other side of the pond. So I'm gonna dip in and out of both of those books and sprinkle a few other wee poems in as well, just to keep the mood slightly more uh, buoyant. Um, I was born in Glasgow to Hebridean parents, 
Um, and I've lived in many places, but Barra, the island of Barra in the Outer Hebrides has, has always been home. And legend has it that two brothers came to Barra from Brittany looking for the finest sand to, to, to make glass. I've traced my family tree as far back as 1715 and I can find no Breton glass blowers, but why let the truth get in the way of a good poem, I say. So I'm gonna start with Elegy for an Island. I am blown glass, made with the lick of foxtail flame. I am the rabbit's foot, thumb rubbed for calm water. I am the Fresnel lens splicing granite fog. I am the living skin of lichen that clings to ruins. I am the fetch that rolls a storm beach of boulders. I am wind that harries the hearth, laments in locks. I am sun on tongue and groove, soft as smeared butter. I am evening hush of flower dust on salt scrubbed wood. I am the blink of harbour lights birthed at night. I am the quartz veined island that wears the world. So this Hebridean family of mine was very equitable. My dad could be found in a boiler suit in the kitchen making scones, while my mum would be in her boiler suit in a bedroom plastering ceilings. It's disappointing all these decades later that gender inequality is, is still so prevalent. Pater familias. When the breadth of your back is no more than narrative beneath the tailored twill of your shirt. When your fingers, gone to driftwood, rattle and clack against the ancestral crest of old gold. When you cannot rise to greet the changing seasons that slant across your vaulted ceiling. When cataracts cloud the sky and your intended ascension seems less assured. May your daughters labour with language, give birth to books that punctuate the end of your line. The next poem is called Mother Tongue. We are all children of migrants. Our ancestors moved from one village to another, from one country to another. Our children will be migrants. Some are lucky enough to choose, some are not. Some of my ancestors were displaced from the Hebrides in the mid 1800s during the time of the Highland clearances none of them by choice. People leave more than just land behind, they leave their culture, their language, and they leave their people. This poem has a small Gaelic phrase, Molienav Bake, which means my little baby, my, my wee one. Mother tongue. While sheep feast, I am outside in with fathomless hunger, brine washed on this brig, salt crusts my hollows. My belly and breast wither like the rotted crop and you, Molienov bake, cloth wrapped in sand. In limbo between two lands, I pray for soil above or below, but no God holds sway in the deep stench of steerage. Sun skims the hammer beaten sea, lights a passage back home to a cairn of small stones where water lessens the shore. I will join you in the dunes, Molienov Bake, and with a flotsam mouth, sing dry my lungs. This next poem, was written in memory of two remarkable women. The first, Mary Lily Walker. She was a social reformer from Dundee 
And in the 1890s, she set up food banks and kitchens for, for mothers and their babies, so appalled by the poverty that she saw in her city. The second remarkable woman is my mum. In 1970s Glasgow, she worked in a meat processing factory and once during an episode of acute poverty stole from that factory to feed my siblings and I, she of course went without. She'd kill me if she knew I was saying this. The deep end. Flaccid light and piss reek seep in from the communal hall. It takes both cold hands to form a grip, turn the key, unlock the door. The kids still asleep in a pleat of thin limbs under sheets and coats and a lanced heart nailed to the wall. I take the pack of sausages from the waistband of my skirt, bend carefully to pick apart damp knots in oversized boots, but still dislodge the bloodied wad of my makeshift sanitary pad. I slide down the wall, pull my knees to the ladder of my ribs and a bleed. I chose to write that poem in present tense, even though I'm referring to 1890s Dundee and 1970s Scotland, just because food and period poverty are still prevalent in Scotland and everywhere else, 2021. The next poem is called Kintsugi, on a lighter note. Um, Kintsugi is the Japanese art of repairing broken things with gold. Fractures are highlighted rather than hidden, and the history of a piece is made more beautiful for, for all to see. The day my mum died, I removed these wee gold hoops from her ears, and I've worn them every day since. That was 26 years ago. They're my, my personal kintsugi. As the ochre fleck in her right eye left, I unhinged golden hoops from still soft lobes with the delicacy of horology, curved the memory of her warmth, vital as the weight of a bee through my own ears, careful not to crease the stained sheet that hid her wounds from neck to navel, my leg pressed to hers, mourned the transfer of heat, a red-hulled ship ploughing through ice fields, sealing the fractures with seams of gold. In an earlier incantation of me, I studied human anatomy at Glasgow University and spent two years dissecting the head and neck of another human. Each nerve, each strip of muscle, each notch and groove of the skull. It was a privilege to, to do so. And it made me think of the body as a vessel carrying an unknown cargo to an uncertain destination. And it often makes me think that we can take nothing with us when we go, wherever we go. And therefore we should be very careful about the memories we leave behind. In the School of Life Sciences. Stories from birth are stored in scars made with blunt handles and sharp blades. I pass specimens in glass jars, pink painted plaster casts of gashed bellies, peeled to reveal dead babies and dead mothers. Through metal doors to regimental rows of steel benches, I am ready to work. Plug my lungs, delay the formalin burn that numbs my nose, salts my eyes. I prize the lid from a plastic tub, raise the neck and head halved last week, study the tongue that tasted the sweetness of another, lips that curved words of bedtime tales before purged of blood and colour.
Glasgow Coma Scale is a neurological assessment of brain activity following severe head injury. It has a maximum score of 15. Three and below, you're dead. Four, you're not viable for life, but you may be resuscitated to keep organs vital for donation. Glasgow Coma Scale. First on scene, emergency services score you six and leave without me. I tail the silence of blue lights, abandon the car in the ambulance bay. Trauma team score you four, pupils not yet fixed, aggressively cared for to limit the risk of cardiac arrest. Your young organs are ready to harvest. I want to seal my mouth to your dented skull, suck shape into cranial plates, ask about the day we lay naked under leaves, tasting the age of rain, placed bets on when the lone apple would fall from the winter bound tree. You already knew and kept it from me. The aging process changes more than just the body. Toddlers and some elderly can share various traits, repeatedly asking the same questions, not always making it to the bathroom in time, struggling to button coats or lace their shoes. Generally, only one lot amuse. We need to be patient and kind to all. Threshold. I lie flat, cup the jut of my hip bone in the hollow of my palm, finger the slow waltz of femoral pulse. I hear her rise. The carpet's soft pile does not absorb the sound of remorse. It is time. She crouches, joints crackle like dry leaves licked by a bonfire's tongue. She was six when I teased a slice of glass from a knee that bled Halloween red. I wrap my arms, thin as willow sticks, around her neck, feel blood drum like a samba de roda beneath skin warm as churned butter. I forget now which one of us is daughter. This next poem is only nine short lines, but it earned me second place in the Oxford Brooks International Poetry Prize. Sometimes we can say more with fewer words. It was written in response to a BBC news article titled The Brown Babies Who Were Left Behind and it references babies born to black soldiers and white mothers in England during World War II. The majority ended up in care homes as their mothers had no social support or financial means to raise them. And as British subjects, the law would not allow for those babies to be adopted by their American fathers. Little Cuckoo. Your mother fought, I'm sure, but lost to slack white jaws, tongues sharp and thin as fish bones. There is no 6 a.m. tick of water warming pipes in this care home, damp and foul as rotting colons. I would feather a nest for you, little cuckoo, bring a feast of worms, but my blackbird beak is crammed with stones. My final poem this evening is called Arrival. And it was placed in the Edwin Morgan Trust competition and published in Gutter magazine this autumn. I wrote it for my son after he came out to me. When I asked how he felt about it being submitted to the competition, knowing that if it was published, he would be publicly outed, he said, Mum, I think Edwin Morgan would approve. I think he's right. 
arrival. Fresh from the warm wound of my body, he carves tooth marks on his cot and takes flight. A light boned bird, he defies small town weather, feathers a nest by an estuary where young stars explore nebulae. Today, he wears happiness like a top hat, tells the world it will not be heeded. I narrow my eyes at the calculation of him, study the gap between pencil's tip and paper. Arrows of light strike the polish of his cheekbones drawn high and bright like Achilles' own. Lips full as berries close to spoiling cannot contain the width of unstained joy. He hands me a picture of a clear-skinned boy, tells me he has found first love. That breath belongs sometimes to air, sometimes to blood. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm so looking forward to hearing wonderful poetry from the other two readers. Thank you. Wow. Folks, uh, I hope that you appreciate hearing the work of Morag Anderson as much as I have this afternoon. And um, it, is, it, is, it is just always a revelation to hear your poetry. Um, and, uh, and, and to, you know, we've, we've, we've just heard from two musicians. You and carry the, the you know different kinds of music, and uh, the the attention to detail, uh, the attention to humanity, the attention to us paying attention to one another uh, in this world. Uh, just, just remarkable, remarkable work from your remarkable press. Of course, I want to mention the new collection again, one more time. It is called "Sin Is Due to Open in a Room Above Kitties," and as um, and I'm going to share it again, it was the best-selling poetry book of 2021 from Fly on the Wall Press. Thank you again for joining us through the power outage. You willed the power. You willed it. Um, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm sorry it's over and I can't wait till the next time I'm in your company. Thank you, Morag. So great to be with you. Thank you, Sandy. Well, I'm, I'm still breathing this all in this 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 afternoon of poetry and there's still more there's still more wow we move next to toronto to hear from another poet we've had the pleasure to hear from before i i and uh, uh lillian is uh an avid poster on our site and uh, connects with the group. And I'm so grateful to be able to have you be part of the new books showcase with your newest collection. And let me tell you a little bit more about Lillian Nekakov. Lillian is the author of a dozen poetry chapbooks and in, and, in, and including the lake contains an emergency room from apartment nine press, which was shortlisted for the BP Nickel Chapbook Award. She has many other collections, including the full length collection Hooligans from Mansfield Press, the Bone Broker also from Mansfield Press, Hat Trick. And if you are not a hockey player and get that reference, Hat trick, three goals in one game. Hat trick from Exile Editions, Polaroids from Coach House Books, and The Sick Bed of Dogs 
from Walsack and Wynn. The newest collection we're gonna hear from today is Ill Virus and, and Lillian will tell you a little bit more about that uh, as we get to hear uh, her read. I love the cover of this book so much as well as what's inside the book. Um, but take, take, take a look at the cover uh, of, uh, which harkens back to um, the old uh, pictures of uh, lithographs. It's very, very, very interesting uh, artwork. Well, Lillian is also the editor of the Bone Shaker Anthology, which is published in print and online journals all across Canada and the US. And for those of you not in the know yet, Lillian runs the Bone Shaker Reading Series in Toronto, Canada. So be sure to check out that venue as well. It is a great pleasure to welcome you, Lillian Nekakov. Hello and thank you for being with us. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very thrilled to be here, thrilled to be reading um, along with Carrie, Morag, and Barbara. Um, just to quickly um, correct you, sorry, Sandy, but my the reading series, the Bone Shaker reading series, uh, ran from 2010 to 2020. So that's oh, uh, over okay. and done, well, unfortunately. So it's 10, no, no problem. 10 years. Um, and it was it was great. It was a wonderful experience. I loved every minute of, minute of it. Um, so today I'll be reading from my new book, um, Il Virus, which um, was published by Anvil Press, edited by Stuart Ross. And it's a book um, that was written in a short, very short period of 78 days during the first lockdown um, of 2020. Uh, when we were just, you know, advised to stay home and not go anywhere, not go to work. And I was just going stir crazy. And I started writing a poem every day. And that's uh, the book came out of that. So uh, the, the uh, poems in the book are not titled, they are numbered. And I'll just read them, um, some of them in order. 11. Remember 1977 when we ate lunch in the abandoned greenhouse and there was a small hole in my dress, but you said, I love you just the same. Remember how we gathered all our thoughts in a dark pile resembling a magpie, left it there for the gardener or the baron, whoever returned first. And remember too, how the machines all sounded like they were, they were reciting a sad poem while we sat hostage at the whim of philodendrons, orchids, and hydrangea. So during uh, that time that we were in lockdown, we did, I'm sure as many of you did, a lot of cooking, um, trying to bake bread, which we hadn't done in years. Um, we're just trying to do anything to pass the time. So um, this one is a little bit about that, number 12. Here we are again at the same kitchen table, day 13. Hostages dreaming of juniper berries elsewhere, rockets and bombs in place of northern lights. Garnet sky. Aria says we are doing World War II cooking. I wish it were that simple as I assume my yellow vest, walk out the door and ask the dog to fetch. There's a lot of walking um, in this poem, um, a lot of time spent with my dog walking. So that'll probably come through in some of the pieces that I read. 17. I tell them, I tell my children, holler past the fever house, holler, holler past God is not acting like God, holler past the calmer days, holler past lonely jugglers juggling syphilitic typewriters once typed we did. Holler past your very address. Holler past you are stuck in this pig shit 4 a.m. skin on fire. Holler. Holler past tree and bush and leaf. Holler past kill count, wings and manuscripts. Mathematics of the edge. Holler past the world is flat. Holler past the crank house, the spill house, the book house. Holler past god damn it. Holler past river you once drowned in. Holler holler past the wild, wild.
This is one of those walking pieces, 20. Just get the sound up a little. Today we walk and recite the rules. No dancing, no hopscotch, no stamp licking, no whisper me to sleep. Last night I cut my husband's hair. Today we walk past the missionary home, past the order of the Holy Cross, where I once stood on a frigid January night to witness a small ceremony I could not comprehend. Today, while we walk, BP pops into memory, loose-jawed and shameless in Nick's backyard on Tyrell Avenue all those years ago, skin crawling with life and laughter, unleashing his lexicon like a prison break. Today, you stand on the right, pass on the left. This is the choreography of life. 23. Buzz Aldrin is sitting in my living room. He has a small bag full of honeymoons. His handshake is lethal. He shows me the place on his arm he once wished was graced with a name tattooed in ruby red. I tell him I am frightened of I don't know what. He stands, opens the window, letting in the eventide, the smell of rain, and an entire New Orleans jazz band. Um, <clears throat> this one is number 77. How we see a submarine depends. Casket, spaceship, womb, bunker, body bag, temple, forest, birdhouse, wardrobe, skin, architecture, wolf belly, pie, on which chamber of the heart we carry each other in. <clears throat> A lot of these poems, well, all of the poems were actually uh, posted daily on Facebook. And um, so that's where they got their first exposure. And it was very a very cathartic experience for me to share them and uh, get responses from colleagues and friends all over and to um, just understand and feel that I wasn't alone in what was going on around me. 100. I decide to join the Shakespeare and Company Lending Library, Brentano's at 27 Avenue de l'Opera. On the right bank requires far too many dictionaries. It will cost me eight francs plus a seven franc deposit. That makes 15. Inside the bookshop, I find Ezra Pound in a swimming pool made of small egoists reading poetry maps and a wolf disguised as the Royal Botanical Kew Gardens. In the corner is a woman whose name is pronounced S-Y-L-V-I-A-B-E-A-C-H. The number on my lending card is 341, which means I am a Canadian in Paris, guilty of nothing. 102. We decide to sew horses. We collect all the needles in the house, count 17, that'll do. Begin with the muzzle, then chin groove, throat latch, and so on, until we reach the soft place from where the heart will grow. Each stitch must be as perfect as a breath, necessary as an emergency. We comb the bookshelves for the fiercest verbs, gather them as if they were embers. We suture the particles end to end. A small amount of ink begins to flow, then a slight rhythm. The sun on its way to setting, the madness of our actions sinks in, and the oh fuck of it all leaks into the exquisite unfolding. <clears throat> 109. Cut, coming out of sleep this morning feels like wading through an oil spill. I make my way to the kitchen. Everything looks right. Three lemons, the refrigerator purring gently like a sleeping animal, a scrap of a note, wake me when the geese come. Everything feels right until it doesn't. I leash the dog, marvel at his very existence, tell him I love him as if for the last time, and we move into the street. 
a confluence of two shadows under an elastic sun. We feel the earth shift a degree, click and release. Everything feels right until it doesn't. A madness of wishing flowers, blossom after blossom, shedding their downy skirts, and I don't even know what to wish for anymore. Lawnmowers and the swishing of a broom, a symphony on the wind, an attempted happiness, everything feels right until it doesn't. David McFadden, there is always some damn poet pacifying the chaos. I think about his trip around a life and how it was more like a trip around a wound and how he filled that wound with snow and love and a white page for all of us who would come after him. We all have our once around and we all and we walk alone and together. I hope that my once around will be more than this simple rhythm of circling the block, existing in the voice of others where everything feels so right. I'm going to read <clears throat> um, a few pieces that are actually newer pieces that are not um, from this book that I've written since. Invisible Tornadoes. Those horses you worshipped at five, then seven, still at twelve, were nothing more than invisible tornadoes. Quarks, photons vibrating through the snow and darkness that worked its way into your body at five, then seven, still at 26. Breaking the barrier of sound, you named those horses Albert and Planck and Heisenberg. Your bones at 13, the crown piece, the brow bank, breaking, my arms empty of you, heart, a derelict amusement park, shouldering the heft of February's into every emergency room where the mercury ground to a halt like a small machine while the doctor sank into mathematical impossibilities and lies easy as quicksand. How could I have known that nothing is solid, that the atoms buzzing through you were just tiny cumulus clouds, your body making ghost bombs, even your slight shadow could not fathom? How could the earth feel at once so callous and tempestuous, and did I let the devil in naming you after my dead mother? How could I have known that every night would fall into my lap like a damaged stethoscope, sculpt sculpting you into an ache as impossible as those horses we once worshipped? I add leap seconds, intermissions, into your infinite affliction opus. Take an axe to the coffin particles beating down the door. Watch them splinter like horse hooves into nothing but dark matter. Can to see time wise here. <clears throat> and now the last piece um, I'll end with is a new piece that is going to be in uh, one, a new chapbook that's coming out from Above Ground Press um, in the new year sometime, I think January or February. Seamus Heaney. One, remember that time we were just kids and so many of us were still alive and I took the red eye from west to east like writing a slow sentence all the way past Cornerbrook, Gander, Seldom until finally falling off Fogo Island into Saturday, standing in a call box outside Dublin airport with the rain heaving down on me, shoulders bent in defeat until I heard the bells of St. Thomas Church on Foster's Avenue while the 6 a.m. garbage collector tidied the street like a librarian gathering books. And remember how the rain stopped and nothing was wrong and morning spread herself over the antennas and milk shops and for one fucking second everything was unbroken and just as it should be. Two. Remember how I climbed the stairs of Blarney Castle to kiss the clock clock na blarnon like a stupid tourist and how there were horses so many horses sweet calcite flattery on the lips and the moon not quite ready to rise and giggling girls the ache of country washing over us and and song carrying over blarney river and come morning i would hitchhike all the way to con stronghold in county Kerry to walk the beach to listen for god's troubles tangled in the thick grass and remember how the cows threaded themselves seamlessly into the day's end and there were bitter apples and kaylees and whispers on the wind 
fiddles and boots and story birds and night ferried across the great seas as if nothing more than air. Three, also that time talking to a busker on Grafton Street when somebody came running past hollering that Seamus Heaney was drinking in Mulligan's on Poolbeck Street and I unbuttoned my coat and started running until I realized it was already too late and I remembered it would someday be now and Heaney would be dead and I would regret not having seen a glimpse of him, broad grinned, jewel eyed, jargon lipped, existing in the twinkling of autumn weather like an ache or a misrecollected word. Four, remember to a small house above the Keys pub on a Galway night, talking until dawn with flouncy boys about Blake, even Boland and Oscar Wilde, listening to Leonard Cohen cassette tapes, promising to write, even though we all knew how easily we would forget to remember once winter came and went, and how when Sunday broke, I would pay the Doolin Ferry Company six pounds to barge me across Galway Bay to Inishmore, where I would sit legs dangling over the cliffs of Erin, well into the into midnight, listening to small cottages moan, each whimper filled with a birth and a drowning, each memory a stone begetting stone. And I remember it was now, and I was sitting in a snowbank listening to Thompson Highway's laughter, filling the air like a gentle mist, like music in the skin of a whale. And I remembered I never did make it to Hindford Street or Cherry Valley or North Road Bridge. And I remembered I never did make it home. Thank you so very much. Oh, what a great reading. Again, let's, do, let's put up the collection. <laughs> it's ill. Virus, there it is. Look at that, uh, uh, absolutely the beautiful, beautiful graphics. Those uh, 19th century uh, portraits. Uh, Lillian, thank you so much for this reading of, as I said, you know, I, we're gonna be so, well, I'm already so grateful for the poets that, that did that daily documentation, not thinking that the number would continue over and over again. You know, when you wrote five, could you have imagined that you'd be still inside, um, you know, after the hundredth? And so for us to have, for us to have um, your record of, of, of your imagery and what, what you experienced, uh, you know, is it and 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 the way that other poets may have gone about similarly is is a real true, um, is a real true gift of each of those is each of those days of each of those days a record. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to um, the new hearing work from the new chapbook as well. Let's be in touch about that. <laughs> Well, my friends, our, we've 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 done it. We've we've arrived at our final reader, which um, I cannot wait to hear from Barbara Quick reading her work <laughs> from the light of Sifnos. I've got a little tickle in my throat, which is uh, only magnified by the tickle that I have all over that I get to hear you read today. Um, it's always a joy when I'm able to hear the work in the original voice of Barbara Quick reading um, her poetry. We will round it out today. What a, what, a, what a quartet you all have been. And here is a little more about Barbara Quick. Barbara is best known as the author of the 12 times translated novel, The Valdi's Virgins. We go back to music, of course. What a musical afternoon we've had. Her fourth novel, What Disappears, will be published by Regal House in May, 2022. Barbara was awarded the 2020 Blue Light Press Poetry Prize for her debut chapbook, The Light on Sifnos, 
and Barbara's work has been featured five times this year on the Writer's Almanac. I should mention as well that we have a fondness here, of course, for Blue Light Press, uh, the wonderful press of Diane Frank in the Bay Area. And Barbara, you're also in that fantastic chapbook, um, Fog and Light, also by Blue Light Press. Barbara's work has been, as I mentioned, featured on the, the Writer's Almanac, worth saying again, and her poems are included in a number of anthologies, in, including two which were nominated this year for a Pushcart Prize. She's, she, uh, she calls home base a uh, small farm and vineyard in Northern California's wine country. And I know you will enjoy hearing Barbara's work as much as I have during these past two years when I've had the pleasure. It's great to have you back with us, Barbara. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sandy. I never, I sort of arrived late, so I didn't have a chance to do a sound check. Is it all okay? You good. sound great. Good, good, good. Um, I am so overwhelmed. It was totally unfair putting me last because I feel so moved by all the gorgeous poetry I've heard today. I'm I'm beside myself. I can barely function. I felt similarly when I heard you interviewed by Grace Cavalieri, Sandy, on The Poet and the Poem, and I heard you read your poetry, and I thought, oh my God, this, this is what poetry is. So I feel very humbled, and I want to, want to thank all of you who came from all over the world today, including my dear cousins in Norway. Thank you for being here. Um, I need to gather myself. Um, I think I'm going to start and end with poems that are not in the chat book, uh, slightly newer work. And the first one uh, will give you some sense of um, where I came from as a poet and as a writer, because all my life since the age of nine, I've written poetry to save myself emotionally. It's been my salvation. And, um, and but, you know, I kind of wrote in private, and it was only this year that my poetry became a public thing. So I'm a bit overwhelmed by it. It feels a little weird. You know, I've been used to being a novelist, but not a professional poet, which I guess I am now. So this is, um, this is a poem that I wrote about my childhood. Um, and I also want to say that I'm a gardener. I do a lot of gardening and I find a lot of poems in the garden. Um, this poem is called This Dark Soil. I break the crust of last year's earth and work the loam to readiness for this year's seeds. Remembering the garden hoe my father gripped in his two hands as I looked on age 12 or so, my baby sister holding tight to my two knees. Our eyes grew wide as captive to his rage, we watched him break the hoe in two and walk inside again. I gathered her up, pushed open the garden gate and sprinted across the street, not wanting to wait for the sounds of what I knew would follow or to see the aftermath of my mother and brother's injuries. And today, a magician, I hold in my two hands an unbroken hoe with which I cultivate this land captive once more in lockdown now, calling forth the sweet fruits of this dark soil. So um, I'm gonna read a little bit from my chat book, which I'm so grateful to Diane Frank and Blue Light press for selecting. Um, 
this is from the beginning of the book. It's called The Light on Sifnos. In 2019, um, my husband and I spent about a month on a tiny Greek island called Sifnos, which amazingly was haunted with ghosts of the Greek past and ghosts from my own past. And um, it was a magical place where I sometimes wrote more than one poem a day, very magically inspiring. The light on Sifnos. How does one describe the light here in this place where the dawn really does have rosy fingers, where the mountains glow at night, their barren slopes a magnet for the radiance of moon and stars, where whitewashed houses on the lowest slopes are strung like chalky pearls around the mountain's throat and oleander blossoms burn like hot pink coals. The shadows are as deep as wells, the air as clear as something newly born. Even early morning light burns its mark on tender human skin, as if the sun were reaching down to tell us that we're changing as surely as the plants that bloom and fade, each bright blossoms moment giving way to new ones. The fairy comes and goes many times every day, bringing bright new tourists to the island, taking others away. The bread my mother gave me she apologized that it was probably stale, but how could it not be when handed to me in a dream on a visit from the afterlife? It had honey baked into the middle and was more delicious than any bread I'd ever tasted. I told her how grateful I felt for this sustenance from her, however late it came for the loving way she looked at me across that distance between life and death. A hand's breadth between us as I received that holy bread and ate to fill that hungry place inside me. My father's maritime compass. I didn't realize when I packed it that it wasn't meant to find one's way on land. Pointed at a lighthouse, pointed at the pole star, star. If you'd taught me how to use it, I could journey through the starry nights by sea, like Odysseus, with 50 strong men at the oars and a goddess watching over me. I would stand there at the helm, once again, your cherished child, face tipped upward, eyes focused on the luff of the sail. Flush with your approval for my light touch with the tiller, I'd point us into the wind as close as I could without causing us to jibe. You taught me how to crew to wait until that moment when the jib went slack and then pull swiftly on the line, hand over hand, ending in a final tug, my feet in white-soled sneakers braced against the combing of the cockpit. Wind the jib sheet round the winch and make it fast, cinched between the teeth of the cam cleat. Shove the heavy handle in and ratchet clockwise while I or someone stronger tailed the line. Some things it's true you taught me well, but how to find my way in life and love was not among these. I wish you had your compass with you now as you journey through the darkness with the other shades Maybe here, 
on this island in the starlight, on the naked rocky slopes that seem to hold the dead inside them, glowing at night with all they loved and hoped for and all they lost and all they failed to find. Thank you. I wrote a lot about various people on the island and this one is called Christos, who collects the trash. Slight of build, dark haired and always unprotective of his smile. He is the happiest man in Camaris or maybe on earth. He knows that what he does is good. The village is a nicer place because of him. Along the single one lane road, along the beach, he picks up any trash he finds and puts it where it won't offend our eyes. He's like the wind that makes rakes the air clean. He loves his job and loves his life, such dignified contentment I've never seen. Calimera! Good morning, he calls out to every passerby, his skin baked brown, his mustache neatly trimmed. I think his mother must have loved him well. He glows with the goodness such love confers. Was she alone in life? Was he the gift that someone left behind, someone who arrived on the ferry and left, never to return, never to know that she bore his child and named him Christos. Calimera, he says to everyone he meets, his dark eyes bright, his head held high. This next poem um, is about another inhabitant of the island I had the privilege to observe. And uh, this is one of the poems that was nominated this year for a pushcart prize. It's called The Mad Car Washer <clears throat> of Camaras. I'm sorry, my age is really showing. I seem to be losing my voice. I excuse myself. Across the way from our cottage, half hidden by a well, he shouts and sprays the rental cars his boss drives, drives over from the port. His head is bare, his gray hair long, his face and neck a mask of scars. He handles the high pressure hose as if it were a weapon and he a warrior. Did his forebears live on the mountainside that's backdrop to his labor, their brown arms wielding bronze to make the rock give up its gold. Apollo rental cars seems anything but old, and yet the madman they employ evokes the ghosts of ancient Greece, hard muscled men whose arguments still echo in the valley, whose joys were brief and violent, whose only comforts were women, drink and sleep, or maybe sheep. It probably didn't matter much to them. What kind of life is this? Washing tourists, dusty cars all day, explosively, compulsively, angrily, one at a time. The boss, Apollo is pale skinned and tall, his beard as neatly trimmed as that of any immortal god. He drives too fast down our one lane road. They shout at one another. It sounds as if they'll come to blows. The ferry brings more tourists to the island. Apollo picks them up in bright, and shiny cars. I'm going to read one of the poems that Garrison Keeler recorded. Um, am I still all right on time, Sandy? Okay. 
just because I want to have a chance to did it. He, do it. He did it wonderfully. This is called skinny dipping in Vati. Above the azure inlet of the sea, the path was steep, carved out between the thistles, thorns, and windblown rock. He left her at the top to find a sheltered place they wouldn't be seen descending to the shore. She waited, fully clothed there, till looking down she saw his gleaming skin and upturned face above the churning deep, as if he'd changed from man to seal and loved this transformation. She shed her clothes and picked her way as far down as she could on tender feet, then took a leap of faith, exchanging rock for empty air, a rush of cold and bubbles in her hair. Her toes touched seaweed as she swam toward her selkie mate. Two naked, slippery people 70 and 65, feeling so alive and filled with joy, treading water side by side in the extra salty turquoise blue Aegean Sea, rich in iodine with the power to heal all kinds of wounds. They tasted salt and kissed two shipwrecked sailors who'd managed to survive. Thank you. Um, I'll end with a, a newer poem. This one is, it's actually forthcoming in, in Scientific American, amazingly enough. It's called The Algorithm. Optimization under uncertainty is a field of study in which my grown son will earn his PhD. The math in his case concerns the production of wind energy. He reads his papers aloud on the phone to me as a way to optimize their clarity so that even a lay person such as myself can understand what he's saying in between each beautifully made equation and graph. For me, it's a matter of optimizing my time with him, my only child who lives so far away and does not get along with the man I married. I'm looking for the algorithm that can minimize the pain entailed for all of us in this awful situation. One needs to account for the in inconstancy of the wind's strength and direction and how best to cant the rotor's turning blades and how the power produced is affected by the wakes created when lots of turbines are working in concert together. We stay on the phone for hours sometimes while I fill my sails with the sweet sounds of my son's voice, filled with longing to hold him close again. I admire the choice he's made to apply his gifts in ways that can make the world a better place, even though uncertainty is omnipresent and must be factored in to every calculation. Thank you so much. Well, make no mistake, you read a poem as well, if not infinitely better than Garrison Keillor. Do not <laughs> underestimate your ability there. You know, I want to just say now, after having read, after having read the poems in the chapbook myself, and of course, 
getting to hear them is a is a is a, a, a vastly expansive experience for which I am tremendously grateful. And I know that you have spent your you have dedicated um, much of your writing life to being a poet, but as you said, kind of in the shadows of 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 your novels. And I'm I'm so so glad that you're bringing your poetry into the light. Into the light. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone. I'm I'm so this was so wonderful. And I want to read the work of all the poets who read today. It was so spectacular. Sandy, you're spectacular. Thank you for bringing these readings to the world. And thank you for including me. Thank you, Barbara. We look forward to the next time, of course, that we get that we are graced with your presence, as well as the presence of all of our poets today. Let me remind you that just a mere 90 minutes ago, we began with Carrie Magnus Radna, then we heard from Morag Anderson, Lillian Nekakoff, and we closed the reading today with the tools of the trade. There were many, many tools in your poems. I noted them. We began, you know, the hoe, the hose, the compass, and those turbines, the tools of the trade, along with the humanity of Barbara Quick's poetry. My friends, how about we unmute and show our deepest of appreciation to our four Stunning work today. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. 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 Gorgeous. Wow. All, from all around the world. Um, wow. Our audience. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> we have folks, we have folks in the audience from Australia and Barbara got a present from Norway. Scott, Norway. Israel. <laughs> Canada, the United and States, Sophia uh, from Czech Ireland, Republic. Of course, <laughs> indeed. Thank you all for being here today. Just a few announcements, and if you have some, feel free to put any readings you have upcoming in the chat. Um, while I just remind you all that next week we'll be back, of course, next Sunday, the first Sunday of December, with our Poets focus on the theme of clocks. First 15 poets that sign up in our chat before the reading. We open up 15 minutes before the reading. Um, sign up, have five minutes apiece on the theme of clocks, which is a vast, okay. vast theme, time, and you get to define the parameters looking forward to how you all will interpret clocks and then we come back on december 11th excuse me december 12th my apologies for our final new books showcase of the year joining us will be sudeep sen from new delhi india kathleen flenikin uh, past Poet Laureate of Washington State. Pamela Hobart Carter will be joining us and one of our audience members today, Marsha Karp. So excited for our final new book showcase as we prepare to uh, open up the new season in 2022. We'll be having lots of poets joining us uh, again, uh, in our open mics and our new book showcases, it has been um, just another insightful afternoon for me to have the grace and the will to be able to hear all of the poets that we featured today. I'm just so grateful to the four of you. And again, a reminder, as we heard from the poetry today, that you know our 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 deepest deepest listening of poetry 
is what allows us to connect to each other across time and space through our humanity to one another through every single day of that pan of, of the pandemic and beyond there will be a beyond and poetry is that thread line through it all thank you to each of you for writing the miraculous poems that you write that help us document the human experience I look forward to seeing y'all next week for our live open mic. I'm Sandy Anone, host of Cultivating Voices, live poetry. I'm wishing um, a happy Hanukkah to all this week. And I send you good health, peace, and the ever loving love of poetry. Be well.